I did two years as an apprentice at the Court Theatre and then uh, moved to Auckland uh, at the end of 1978. And uh, for 1979 and onwards, I joined Theatre Corporate. Theatre Corporate took a lot of uh, took theatre and education seriously, and those programmes which we did. I mean, the first year I was there, I rehearsed seven different shows in about four weeks. These were like 45 to 50 minute shows, uh, so that we could perform from the new entrance, five year olds, right through to seventh form. And for the seventh formers, we had um, a version of Hamlet and. Uh, stories of Catherine Mansfield. first TV role actually was before any of that. The first TV role was in 1976. Uh, I was at university that year and it was um, a, a South Pacific television. They, they had the series called 30 Minute Theatre and I did something called Tinkling Brass which was taken from uh, the Bible, you know, the New Testament. And that was my first ever television experience and it, it, it was directed by uh, John McRae, who was head of TV for a long time, TV drama and stuff like that. Uh, and then the first TV I really did um, was a Sunday theatre for TV One, uh, and it was called Casualties of Peace, directed by Mike Smith. And then that same year I auditioned for a TV show called Heroes, which was a series about a band, and that went to two seasons, and I got that. I got a role, Death Warmed Up, in Death Warmed Up, which is David Blythe's movie. My character was a young guy, brainwashed when he's a kid, you know, and uh, he's the hero who takes revenge on the evil doctor who killed his parents, or made him kill his own parents. Traumatised individual. People like that can't live, so he dies at the end. And, you know, he takes his friends with him and it costs all of them their lives, almost, sort of thing. We didn't see rushes or anything like that. Um, and, in fact, I didn't see anything until I saw a screening of it. And um, this was at the Cinerama, which used to be halfway up Queen Street. And they said, come down for an informal screening. I didn't realise they'd invited all these schools along, these high schools. So it was packed. And it was, I think, a five o'clock screening on a Friday. And uh, I went with uh, Jennifer and um, some friends, Lise Hroth and people like that. Some really good friends. And we all went to see it. I hadn't seen any of it. And um, I just... I have to be honest, I just hated every minute of it. And when I left, I couldn't even speak to anyone. I left, and this is the irony of it. This, I remember this moment. This is one of these tragic moments. Um, that was down at Cinerama, and I was working at Theatre Corporate, which, as you know, was up in Galatos Street. And actually, I was in uh, The Winter's Tale, William Shakespeare, and I was going to go from the screening up to the performance. And uh, the screening finished, I don't know, this seven o'clock and the performance was at eight and I walked up through Myers Park by myself. I couldn't even stay with Jennifer. I just had to be by myself after the screening. And it was winter and I, it, it was dark and I stopped halfway up and I sat in a park bench and I cried my eyes out. I thought it was, I just thought it was, I just made an appalling, appalling job of it. Everything about it. And uh, then I just, I sort of went, okay went up and I did Shakespeare and got a real buzz off doing that and I, that I actually said at that point I'm never going to do a film, I'm only ever going to do I actually remember saying that to myself. Uh, but then uh, very quickly by about 80, well 85 we did um, Dangerous Orphans which the listener review described as a tedious uninvolving thriller. <laughs> I don't know how you had one of those but we had one. <laughs> And then after that, it was, uh, after Dangerous Orphans, it was Desperate Remedies, which was an amazingly fun experience. And one of those experiences where my recollection of it is that they were making it up as they went along. I mean, I know that Stuart Main had an amazing book of his storyboards with all cutouts from, um, you know, movies with Gloria Swanson and all those people in it, you know, to sort of put that look. Talk about obsessive. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, it would have taken him ages. But, um... Uh, I remember that the exigencies of the production were that we were in this bloody warehouse and on the war a wharf on the waterfront and you know we would be rehearsing one scene in one set and literally over the other side of the flat they'd be building the scene the set for the next day and we had to sort of jockey for time with no sound that made me love film again that made me love the artistry of not just film. Seeing Leon work taught me a whole lot about everything I do because I never forget one day we were 
there's a shot in the movie where he hears um, the wind rustling a bead curtain and he's trying to find a sound for the bead curtain and it's whether there's a ghost of you know it's quite a spirit sort of thing and Leon was discussing looking at this bead curtain in the set and listening to it and looking at it and putting light on it and everything to choose whether it was the right bead curtain and I just went wow this is like fantastic. Di Rowan rang me up and said hey they're doing Hercules do you want to have a go? So I went got the script of a scene which I thought was dreadful. It had lines in it like I don't know Hercules it must have been some kind of monster I mean just you know I just thought oh, you know I mean I, I, I'd done all the Shakespeare for God damn it, you know. I have a collection of swords, you know, from various Shakespeare's I've done, so I turned up with this bloody great broadsword, big double handling steel, singlet, I was pretty buff. And I did this audition, I did it like like um, John Wayne. I don't know, Hercules must have been some kind of monster. And I thought, well, that's what. Forget that, and left. Now, as it turns out, I know because I've become really dear friends with um, one of the producers, Eric Grunderman. And he said that uh, he's told me in retrospect that um, they basically had thought they were going to cast it in America, but Die just kept saying, "You've just got to see this guy. He's got lots of energy, lots of energy." And uh, they really liked my audition. I got a call to go and see them the next day. Got to go and see them. So I went out to Mount Wellington, where their studio was at that time, and I went to this big boardroom. And honestly, it was like six Americans, all six foot tall, with cowboy hats. And, hey, how are you? Good. And I just was overwhelmed. And, and Eric was one of them, um, the director was one of them, the, a couple of producers, David Icke, who went on to do uh, Battlestar Galactica, all this sort of stuff. Hey, how are you, how are you? And they started talking to me, and I got really kind of like, you know, and um, so I was just talking to them in my voice, you know, and about, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing theatre, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And then finally, one of them said, can you do the American accent? And I just went, Christ, you know, in my head. So I said, look, you've seen my tape. You know I can do the American accent, really arrogant. And one of them went, yeah, look, could you just read this? And it was a, a letter, like, Dear Eric, with regard to you, it was a letter. I went, oh, crikey, son. Dear Eric, with regard to your letter of the 31st instant. And as soon as I started that, they all went, ah, <laughs> started talking. See you later. And I got the part, like, in about an hour. One of the things that happened during the show is I got to direct Hercules and Xena, but of course, we had to fly to LA to edit them. Because when they set it up, they weren't sure this is before the Lord of the Rings, remember, or any of that. In fact, this, you could say, pre was a precursor to that, started that ball rolling. Um, they weren't sure whether they were skilled editors or facilities or whatever. So, consequently, they'd set that up as a deal. So, now, with uh, Legend of the Seeker, it's all done here. Yeah, I do uh, engage with fans still. I still go to conventions. I have a lot of people that turn up to see Xena conventions. It wasn't even in Xena, hardly. But because I directed some really popular episodes of Xena, and because I do the Widow Twanky, which is a drag act, which, you know, um, is always pushing that sort of gay, you know, slightly men dressed as women button. Americans love it. Just right at the end of Herc, um, I won the position of director of Jubilee for South Pacific Pictures. I had to shoot that in many ways at a faster rate than we shot Hercules because we really only had one camera most of the time. It was, it was great to work with, um, you know, with Cliff and Teresa Healy and... Leon again, that was wonderful. I loved, loved just working with Leon and the way we, it's a beautifully shot film, it's a beautifully made film, I think it's a good film. Oh, I did a thing called Love Muscle, which I was sad to say didn't get the best showing it could have got. And now, of course, it's become a bit of a curiosity because it's Kevin Smith, one of the last things he ever did. It's bloody funny, really funny. Love Muscle, M-U-S-S-E-L, the um, aphrodisiac shellfish, it's funny. It made a movie in America um, this time last year, actually, which I was in, um, called Bitch Slap, and that's going to be released um, quite soon, I imagine. And that was shot on a red camera, which is a beautiful new digital camera, yeah. and that was a revelation watching that happen. That was just amazing, the, the technology and the speed and... Um, uh, we shot for three weeks in the Mojave Desert and then another three or four weeks in a green screen studio. And that green screen stuff, and that's how Spartacus will be shot, you know, fantastic.